Hello there, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to this presentation, our last show of the day, our tour of the universe. Now, I'd, I'd like to find out before we go too far, how many of you were here earlier today to see our other show, Big Astronomy? A few? Okay, more? Okay. Don't be embarrassed. It's okay. Welcome back. This is a different kind of show that you're going to see. Uh, Big Astronomy was largely playback, and this show is mostly live. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a virtual trip through the solar system. We're going to fly through a three-dimensional, uh, 3D uh, uh, digital model of our universe. So we'll leave Earth behind, leave our, have a look at our solar system, look at the galaxy, leave the galaxy, and look at the distribution of other galaxies in the universe, and then we'll come back home to Earth by five o'clock because that's closing time for the museum. Now, since this is a live presentation, I'll be piloting us live through this database and I will try not to crash into any planets or fly into any black holes. But if the immersiveness of the image on our dome starts to make you feel a little disoriented, just close your eyes for a minute or so and that'll really help. And that'll, that'll set you back firmly on planet Earth and uh, any of those sensations of discomfort should go away. Before we begin, we would like to remind you again, one more time, that during the presentation, we'd appreciate it very much if you could please refrain from snacking or any kind of photography or recording. This would also be a great time to silence your personal electronics. Don't take any calls during the show. And we do ask that you please keep your masks on during the entire time, even in the dark. At the end of the show, we ask that everyone please exit out through the doors at the top of either stairway. You can use either one on either side of the dome. If getting all the way up these stairs is going to be too much of a problem for any of you, then just stay in your seat at the end, and our staff will assist you out the lower doors. But everyone else, please use these doors at the top. And if you do have to exit during the show, please keep in mind the doors will lock behind you, and re-entry will not be possible. So with that, let's get ready to go into outer space. Now, one famous astronomer once said, that outer space is not very far away at all. It's only an hour's drive if cars could go straight up. And that's, that's pretty much true because by many definitions, um, including NASA and an international organization which sets certain kinds of uh, limits on things, um, outer space begins Depending on your definition, either oh, either uh, 50 miles up, which is the definition NASA uses, or about 62 miles up, or 100 kilometers, which is the definition that the rest of the world uses. We're going to start a little bit lower than that, and then we'll take off from here. And we are right above the California Academy of Sciences. You know, it's, it's not easy to recognize this building from overhead. But as we rise higher and higher into the sky, you'll be able to see where we are in Golden Gate Park. There's the uh, music concourse to the upper left of us. Golden Gate Park stretching off to the left and to the right, three and a half miles in length. And the rest of San Francisco appearing now in our field of view as we travel farther and farther up into the sky. Now, we're going to get up into outer space a lot faster than an hour's drive. A lot of rockets can do that in about 10 minutes. And this is um, about 100 kilometers. Now, this is sort of the international definition of outer space. It, it really varies a little bit because outer space is really where the air is so thin that control surfaces like wings and rudders and flaps don't work anymore. And you have to use um, rockets. To maneuver. But we're traveling up higher and higher and now you can see the spherical shape of our planet and pretty soon we'll, we'll bring in some weather patterns here too. And all of this imagery that you see, by the way, is um, it's uh, based on actual information, real data, because this is um, this is all based on, on real photography from oh, up till about yesterday or so. We're using a piece of software that is uh, NASA supported, and it, it is all based entirely on actual photography and observer, uh, observational data. 
So if you'd like to find out a little bit more about this software, which you can actually download for free and install on your computer at home, um, you can come and see me after the show and I'll tell you a little bit more about how you can get your hands on it. Uh, but uh, it's something that uh, NASA has developed and is uh, really encouraging people to, to make use of as, a, as an educational tool. As we travel higher and higher up into the sky, we'll back away from the Earth. And as we travel away from our planet, we'll go the farthest that humans have ever traveled from Earth. And that is a place where they went about 50 years ago. Now, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring up um, the orbit of this particular object, our own satellite, the moon. And you can see it right there circling around the Earth. And we'll center ourselves on the moon itself right there. Oops, that was a little fast. But let's now move in to look at the moon. Now, 50 years ago, the astronauts of the Apollo program uh, traveled to the moon, which is a quarter of a million miles away from Earth, or 240,000 miles. And it took them about three or four days to get there. We can do that in a lot less time. And as we do, we can see the moon getting bigger and bigger in our field of view. And let's have a good close look at it. What we can also do here is we can turn off the shadows on the, uh, the unilluminated half of the moon. And that way we can see the entire face. And this is the face that we normally see from Earth, which is the more familiar side. And we can see the moon is covered with uh, lots and lots of craters. It also had those large dark uh, patches on its surface. The dark patches are called maria. That's a Latin word, which means seas, because early astronomers used to think that those dark patches were bodies of water. So they called them seas and oceans. And today we know that they're not really bodies of water. They're large, flat plains of dried lava, which bubbled up about a billion years ago, spread out and cooled and hardened into these giant flat plains of rock. And since that time, other craters have formed on top of those plains. And so you see them standing out sharply. And some, like the one in the center of our field of view right now, have these splashes of material surrounding them. They look like they've been splashed out. And, and they really have. That material is called ejecta, and it's material from underground that was splashed out when the impact that formed this particular crater called Copernicus, uh, or no, this one called Kepler, uh, when this crater was formed. And all the craters on the moon were formed by the impacts of uh, asteroids or comets at some time in the moon's past. The really big crater over on the right-hand side, to the right of Kepler, is called Copernicus. And that one is about, I think it's about, about 100 miles across, something like that. The lighter colored areas on the surface of the moon are called the highlands. And those are older areas on the moon's surface. And they haven't been covered over by lava. So they don't have maria covering them up. And so you see a lot more craters in the highland areas, as we can see right now. So this is our satellite, the moon, the farthest that humans have ever traveled from Earth, 240,000 miles. Again, took them four days to get there. We can get there a lot faster there and back. And there's something else that can get there really fast. And that is radio signals or light radio signals being just another form of light. And radio signals can get to the moon from Earth in about one and a half seconds. They can travel really fast. Their speed is something like 186,000 miles per second. So if you could travel as fast as light, 186,000 miles a second, you could travel around the world seven times in one second. You can get from the Earth to the moon in one and a half seconds. And you could go other places a lot faster than any spacecraft can presently go. We're going to back off from uh, the moon and have a look at where we are in the solar system. So there's the, uh, the moon going around the Earth. We'll add in the orbits of the other planets as well. That way we can get our orientation uh, a little bit better. And as we uh, continue backing away from our planet, we'll see the other planets and the sun appearing in our field of view. So there's the orbit of, of Earth, the third planet from the sun. Now we're beginning to see the other orbits. There's the sun right in the center of the solar system. And the two planets closest to the sun are Mercury and Venus. 
There are also rocky planets like the Earth is. A little bit farther out from Earth is another small rocky planet. That's the red planet Mars. Then there's a big gap in between Mars and the next planet out. And that uh, gap is not empty. It's actually filled with lots of other objects, rocky metallic objects called asteroids. And there are several hundred thousand asteroids that are known. So if we can just briefly show the asteroid belt there between Mars and the next planet, which is Jupiter, you can see some of those. And that's just some of the really small uh, material that orbits the sun. And they're not just planets. There's also asteroids and comets and mini planets and dwarf planets and all sorts of other stuff. So let's, uh, let's turn off the asteroids and continue traveling out past the outer planets, um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And these evenings, Jupiter and Saturn are really easy to see. They rise at about the same time the sun sets. So you can see them over in the southeastern part of the sky uh, as soon as it gets dark. Now we're traveling even farther out, and uh, we're going to brighten the sun just a little bit because we've been cheating just a, a, a little so far. Uh, we've dimmed the sun so that we could see the planets at the same time. But now we're letting the sun uh, be as bright as the other stars, uh, relatively speaking. And as you travel even farther out, then we'll see um, that the, 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 the stars are not just uh, all the same distance away. They are different distances from us. And you can see as we fly past some, there are some that are really far away that don't seem to move at all. One other thing that I want to show you is um, the farthest that, well, not any spacecraft has traveled. We already passed that point. The farthest spacecraft uh, have ever gone from Earth is about uh, 16, 14 billion miles. But that's not even as far as light can go in one day. But the farthest uh, anything sent by humans has ever gone into space is contained inside this sphere, which we see here. This is sort of a, a bubble of radio signals that have been given off from the Earth and which has been radiating out at the speed of light for about the past hundred or so years. So this radio bubble is our human footprint. The, 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 the farthest signals of humanity stretching off into the universe. Now, if there are any uh, other life forms on, on planets uh, elsewhere in space, if they're within that radio bubble, then they might be aware of us. Maybe they are technologically capable of receiving those radio signals and they would know about us. If they're outside that radio sphere, they haven't heard about us yet because our signals haven't gotten there. So that is our radio footprint in the universe, about, about 100 uh, light years in radius, so roughly 200 light years across. Now, we are part of the Milky Way galaxy, of course, and as we back away farther and farther from our solar system, we'll see exactly where we are. Let's continue moving farther and farther out. You can see the glow of the Milky Way behind us there in the background. From Earth, the Milky Way looks like a faint band crossing the sky because it is flat and uh, it's dish-shaped, disc-shaped rather. And as we look along the disc from Earth, we see that band of light crossing the sky. However, from outside, the Milky Way actually looks like this. It's a huge spiral of several hundred billion stars, which you can see here. It takes a beam of light roughly 100,000 years to get from one side of the galaxy all the way across to the other. We on Earth, uh, in our, our, our solar system, are nowhere near the center of the galaxy. Instead, we are about two-thirds of the way out from the center. And in fact, I left our radio sphere on. Can you still see it? It's that really faint spot right at the center of our field of view right now. There it is. That's where we are in the Milky Way galaxy. And you know, a lot of the stars, most of the stars that we can see in our sky are confined to, to an area right around that spot. We can see only a small part of the Milky Way galaxy. There are lots of stars farther and farther out that we can't see at all because they're just too far away for us to see. But that's where we are in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, about 100 years ago, 
Astronomers discovered that the Milky Way is not the only galaxy in the universe. They used to think so. But then in, around the 1920s, an astronomer named Edwin Hubble discovered there are other galaxies in space. And in fact, not only are there other galaxies, which made the universe a lot bigger place than astronomers had thought before, not only is it bigger, but it's also getting bigger still. Because Hubble found out that the galaxies are all moving apart from each other. The universe is expanding. And so that's what he, one of the things he found out. Now that we're outside the galaxy, we can see that galaxies are clustered into groups and families. Our own Milky Way belongs to one such family called the local group. And it contains about 30 or so galaxies of which the Milky Way and uh, another galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, are the two largest members. But there are a couple of dozen other smaller members. And these galaxies are millions of light years apart. And now that we're outside the galaxy, every single spot of light you see is not a star, but is a galaxy, each one containing perhaps hundreds of billions of stars, just like the Milky Way. And look how many galaxies there are. Remember, this uh, NASA program is showing us real data. This is all based on actual observations. So each one of those spots of light does represent a real galaxy in the sky. And as we travel farther out into, into the universe, you'll see how the galaxies are distributed in space. They're clumped together forming large structures, large chains or super clusters. And there are large, huge voids in between them. And as we continue traveling even farther out, this is our most up-to-date map of the entire universe that we have. And you might think that the universe has a really interesting shape. Now, here is our current 3D map of the universe. All the galaxies that we know of so far, or many of them anyway, uh, can't show all of them because that would be a little too much data for this program. But if you look at this three-dimensional map of the universe, the universe seems to have this very unusual shape. It almost looks like a, like a big hourglass, or even a, a, some have compared it to a, a butterfly or a bow tie. You see those empty areas right around the middle there? And then those two giant fans or cones stretching off to the sides. Is that the real shape of the universe? Well, no, because the empty spaces that you see there, those big voids between the two fans or the cones, those are not empty space. Those are actually areas that we haven't mapped very well yet because we haven't seen them very well. And the reason we haven't seen them is because there's something in the way. What's in the way is our own Milky Way galaxy. The plane of the galaxy contains a lot of dust that blocks our view of many distant objects. And so we're looking along the plane of the Milky Way right now. That's what's blocking our view and preventing us from seeing a lot of other galaxies farther beyond. And so eventually, as our technology gets better and we develop better techniques, our, our map of the universe will fill out as we see more and more galaxies out there. But the farther into space we look, it's fascinating to, to realize that the farther into space we look, the farther back in time we're looking. When we look at distant galaxies that are millions of light years away, we're looking at them as they were millions of years ago. Because that's when they first give off the light that we are just now seeing here on Earth. And the farthest out that we have been able to see... Uh, the most distant objects that astronomers have mapped, uh, we'll add them to our model here, are what are called the quasars. Now, quasars are believed to be the centers of very young newborn galaxies, very energetic centers uh, of galaxies just being born. And about a million quasars are known, each one roughly uh, a thousand times more energetic than a typical galaxy. So those orange dots that you see on the outsides of the cones, those are some of the quasars that we know of, the most distant objects we have observed. But permeating the entire universe is something else. 
something even older than the quasars, which are about 10 billion light years away, which means their light took 10 billion years to reach us on Earth. But pervading the entire universe is a faint radiation, which we've represented here as that mottled orange color. Uh, that radiation is called the uh, cosmic microwave background. Sometimes it's also called the three degree radiation because astronomers measured its temperature and found that it's about three degrees Kelvin or three degrees above absolute zero. And that's the temperature to which uh, astronomers believe the universe has cooled since the universe began expanding, since the galaxies began moving farther and farther apart. That prediction was made in 1948, and in 1965, a couple of astronomers were able to measure the temperature of this radiation, and they found that it's three degrees Kelvin. So this is uh, said to be the best evidence for what's called the Big Bang, the moment that the universe began to expand. And this is the farthest out we can travel, the farthest out we can see. And that being the case, the only place to go is back in. So let's return home from about 14 billion light years out. We'll pass the quasars, which are roughly 10 billion light years away, and pass through our map of the galaxy again to return back toward the center of the map, which is where we're located, which makes it seem as if we're at the middle of the entire universe. Are we that important that we are the center of the universe? No, not really. Uh, the reason that we appear to be at the center of the universe uh, of this model is because we're the ones who made the map. Uh, it's a, a result of our perspective, our point of view. We're looking at everything around us. And so, of course, we're going to seem to be the center of everything. But we're really not. As we approach the local group, our cluster of galaxy, return to the Milky Way, return to the... Uh, outer edge of one of those spiral arms, there's our radio sphere again. And there's one other thing I'd like to point out. You know, in all this universe that, that we've seen so far, um, uh, 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 people have wondered whether or not there are worlds like Earth. Have we found any other planets out there uh, outside our solar system? And the answer to that is yes, we have found other planets. And since about 1994, astronomers have discovered more than 4,000 planets orbiting distant stars. And we see representations of them right now. And these are, again, actual uh, locations of other planets called extrasolar planets or exoplanets. More than 4,000 of them have been found. Are any of them like the Earth at all? Do any of them have life? We don't know. And for that to happen, you need a lot of particular factors to all to, to work together. This, it's got to be the right kind of planet. It's got to be made of the right stuff. It can't be a large gaseous ball like Jupiter or Saturn. It should be made of rock, we think. It should be the right distance from its star. It should orbit the right kind of star. And it can't be too close so that it's too hot or orbit too far away that it's so cold. It has to have the right combination of uh, minerals and elements in its composition so that it can support life. It's got to have liquid water on its surface. It's got to have other uh, materials that uh, can be nutrients for whatever life develops on its surface. And so there are a lot of things that, that a planet needs in order for it to support life. And so far, although we haven't really found a lot of information about other worlds out there in, in the universe. Even though we found 4,000 plus exoplanets, we don't know too much about them. We know that many of them are probably not hospitable to life, but we're not sure how many of them are. So, so far as we know, there's really only one place in the universe that has the right combination of conditions that allows life to exist and that is our own planet, Earth. And we find that in the entire universe, there is indeed no place like home. So with that, welcome back home to the planet Earth. And we hope you've enjoyed this tour of the